Yeah. All right. So there we go. Stick it in my beard. Okay, there we go. And these mics don't like me. Anybody have any prayer requests? Yeah, let's continue to pray for the Bowman family. So that would be Delisa Farrar and Charlotte Wilson's mom, and then Samantha Badgley's grandmother, Ashley Wilson, who is, those are attached to our church. So I spoke with Delisa for a minute today, just let them know we're praying for them. So um, pray for thinking of them, and if they watch this, pray for people that we haven't seen in two years, that maybe they'll come out and spread out at Easter. Um, I would love to see more and more people coming back to church. I think that, that I feel like that we're going to start seeing that. People seem to be um, wanting to get out. So, and then pray for Jerry and I as we remember names and family members and don't mistake families and husbands and wives and call people other names, like today at lunch. But at Jerry's defense, he hadn't seen her in two years, so it was a miracle he remembered her name. Um, <laughs> I know you're watching this, Rhonda. You watch every week. Um, <laughs> But pray for us as well just because it's it's hard to explain until you've been in that position where 3,000 people know you and you can't possibly know 3,000 people. So, and I'm glad that, that there's mercy and grace extended. Um, pray for the community service on Friday with a good Friday service, that all of that goes exactly the way it's supposed to. Continue to lift up Jim Ransom in your prayers. Do you know he um, had fallen asleep in his trailer it would have been the week before last, and got carbon carbon monoxide poisoning. Good grief, can I not speak? And um, they had to put him in a chamber to get get his, his body back to normal. Yesterday, he ended up back in the hospital late last night for that. So I wanted you to continue to pray for him. Um, doctor is telling him he needs to take it easy for six weeks. So as Joyce is asking us to pray that Jim will do that, or she'll hit him with a hammer. Or something like that. So, but he's got to take the six weeks. So let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love, your mercy, your grace. Lord, I'm so grateful that we get to come before you boldly before your throne. Lord, that we're not just casting empty words on something that's in the void. But when we pray and we lift up our requests, that you hear each and every one of them. That you care about the smallest things in our lives just as they are the big things. Lord, we ask that you would be with the Bowman family, Lord, as they're dealing with the, the loss of a loved one. And Lord, continue to be with those that are, are still dealing with that loss, the loss of losing somebody that was close to them. Lord, I ask that you'd be with Marcia. She's about to start the grief support group back up, that you would be with her and Joyce as they minister to the teens that are dealing with, with the loss and the teens that just seem to lose more and more grandparents. Father, we all handle things just a little bit different. And I'm reminded that you wept at Lazarus' tomb, and you knew you were going to wake him up. But grief is a part of the human condition, but your joy surpasses that grief. Lord, we just ask that we would seek your face. Lord, I ask that you'd be with Jim, that you would touch him, Lord, give him, give him peace to where he can just sit back and, and recover properly. Be with Joyce as she's trying to minister and take care of her son. Or that you would, you would just give her the words to say and, and how to be a loving mom, but not so pushing to where he's going to run out and be like every other man I know. Touch him, Lord. And Lord, I just ask that you be with us tonight. Be with our preparation for, for Resurrection Sunday, preparation for Good Friday. That you would have all of that in your control. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together and the people assemble. Which of their gods foretold this a proclaimed to us and proclaimed to us the former things? Let them bring in their witness to prove they were right, so that others may hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. So that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, 
nor will there be one after me. Isaiah 43, 8 through 10. This has been the continual, continual progression within Isaiah as we've done this study over the last now 19 weeks. Can you believe that? It's been the, the continuation going down through Isaiah, and this is the one for, the, the, for this one. And it's talking about you being witnesses. We kind of went over that a little bit last week, that you are the witness of Jesus Christ. And it's not just a, a normal witness, but you're a credible witness. You understand what a difference is? It's kind of like you can say, well, I've lived in the world and I've witnessed poverty, but you've never truly experienced it. You understand what I'm saying? So like when I went to Mexico, I went to a city that was made out of concre or concrete, out of cardboard. They wish they had concrete, cardboard boxes that had electricity put into the boxes. And some of them, they were using electrical wire that they were tapping into the line, and they had broke it down and broke it down and broke it down. And my Uncle James, who's, who was still alive then, obviously, had explained to me why they had broke it down multiple different ways because they needed to get it from where it was coming in on the line down to 110 so they could use it in their box. So not only were they living in the box, but they were stealing power from the power grid because they were that poor. And I've witnessed that, but the witness that he's talking about is that I'm a credible witness because I've experienced it. So I am a witness of the Lord and a servant whom he's chosen so that we may know and believe in him and understand that we are called to know that before him there was no God, nor will there be one after him. So we're called to be witnesses that are not just, okay, I've seen it, but I've experienced it. Amen? Not just, okay, I know what you're talking about, but I can tell you what it's like. That's the kind of witness that God's calling us to be. So he's saying, taste and see that the Lord is good. Right? So I don't know, Hannah's with the little kids right now, but Hannah is the pickiest eater that I've ever known. And she just ate that awesome casserole that was downstairs. And she was sitting there going, man, I, a year ago before you got on to me, I would have never even tried it. And this is so good. Taste and see, he is good. Let's watch this video really quick. I say really quick, it's 16 minutes long. This is the bulk of what we're doing today. These people have been helping me to eat. Hi, how are you? Good. 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 Multiple demons. I saw it myself. They jeered at me from inside her mouth. Nothing could be done for her short of a miracle. And she won't say who restored her. He did not reveal his name to her. <laughs> what? What? It has begun. What has? If he's healing in secret now, the public signs cannot be far off. Public signs? What? You know him? You can say that. What's his name? Who has ascended into heaven and come back to I heaven? asked his name. Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Don't quote Solomon to me, you wild mongrel. Who has wrapped up the waters? Venica, finish. No, you answer me first. Teacher of Israel, finish the oracle of Agur, son of Jekyll. Who? has established all the ends of the earth. What, what is, is his name, son? and what is the name of his son? Surely you know. You are careless with Torah. God does not have a son except Israel. Israel is his only son. All of us. Suit yourself. You know, they'll put a man to death for blasphemy like that. Who will? You? It'd be a terrible precedent for Rome to adjudicate. You should never have come here. All your life you've been asleep. Make straight the way for the king. He is here to awaken the earth. But some will not want to awaken. They're in love with the dark. I wonder which one you'll be. This man is anything like you believe, or if he exists at all. 
You should leave this region. Your presence alone puts him in danger. If you think he needs my help, you've heard nothing. When the song is over, bring out the olives and the cheeses. Set them on the long table in between the loaf of bread and the cucumbers. Than the magic number all along. The head count? Why? Are we over? They always do this. I've got food enough and more. The last count was 80. You made a mistake. Maybe by a few. Even if I'm off by five, the wine. I did advocate for a fourth. But three is, is still enough. Four or sixty. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. Amen. 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 Lighten your pores, like this. Three quarters full. If they ask you for more, tell them you'll be right back. But guess what? You won't be. Understand? to be happy so far. The servants do not. How are we doing? Nothing to worry about. You are one of the finest banquet masters we have ever seen. Keep up the good work. Hmm. <laughs> no. I have an idea. Thank you so much for coming. Duffy! Dinah! Oh, Abner. Well, this is the best party I've been to in a long while. <laughs> you honor us, Adler. We are blessed to have two children so in love. Ah, I'm happy too. I'll be honest, I was not always happy about this. You may not have known that. Yes, we know. Hey, you <laughs> were born in Nazareth, Dinah. Rafi, your people are travelers. And your trade, Rafi, it hasn't brought you much success. And well, Asher seems like a nice young man. He has not yes, yet. Yes, Abner. We get it. Yeah, I don't mean to insult. My family have been powerful traders in this region for years. I believe success has made my generation arrogant. I lost my train of thought. I thought you said this was crooked. Looks fine to me. <laughs> and this wine is delicious. I must know the vineyard. <laughs> Purification water. There's still some left in these. Dilute the wine. People will notice. Whispers will spread. If they did, I feel like this family would die of shame. What about us? We'd be ruined. It's not a great option, I agree. So help me think. We could... serve the guests extra date cakes, oversalt the food, make them thirst for water. I don't know. This is humiliating. Let's keep looking.
They have no idea who sits before them. <laughs> to be a child again, yes? I think we are the lucky ones. They have to go home with their parents tonight. We get to stay with him and his mother. Where will that be? Who knows? With him, I have learned to stop worrying about those things. I haven't. It's cold in this region. You think he would let you freeze? My brother has many worries. I keep reminding him of when our Abba taught us how to fish. We just sat there and watched until we became fishermen. Mm. We will watch him. And watch and watch and watch. Forever, I think. I'm going to get more wine. <laughs> get two. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm here. It's usually the students that choose the rabbi, not the other way around. And I'm not even a student. Neither was I. Thaddeus introduced me to him. How did you meet? <laughs> On a uh, construction job in Bethsaida. He hasn't exactly been picking the best and brightest students. What? <laughs> he works? Well, until recently. He's not a professional rabbi. Yeah, but I thought he has no home and no job. No permanent home. He's a stonemason. Like you. A craftsman. He taught as well. He asked me to follow him. He said he was building a kingdom. A fortress stronger than stone. I believed him. What were you building in Bethsaida? <laughs> uh, uh... A public amenity. An aqueduct? No, of a... something, uh... humbler. What then, man? It's, it's not proper to say in front of a woman. I have seen and heard things that would turn your blood to ice. A latrine? <laughs> Wait... ice? Yes. Our master building a privy. A job <laughs> is a job. I've... I was cutting stone for the retaining wall. He, he was building a ramp of cedar planks so the crippled and the elderly could get to it without climbing the steep steps. But why didn't he heal them so they could mount the steps themselves? He's always saying his time has not yet come. Calling your name. The catch of the fish. Why was it his time for miracles then and not others? Because those were private. He, he hasn't shown his signs to, to others publicly yet. What's keeping him from making his ministry public? The wind blows to the south or to the east, and you cannot say why. A latrine. <laughs> yeah, we better not spread that around. He doesn't hide where he's from. Oh. Don't tell Andrew. Andrew. Yeah, he'll be surprised. <laughs> and now, friends, the dance of Miriam. Thomas? Talk to me. Just watch out for the frogs this time. <laughs> oh, sons of Jonah! We were just looking for you. They're dancing to the song of Miriam, and we thought you wouldn't want to miss it. Of course. Let the three of us show them how it's done, huh? I don't think that's such a good idea. Why? Andrew has four left feet. Four? <laughs> Why four? When he tries to dance, he looks like a donkey walking on hot coals. <laughs> oh, Andrew, do you deny it? I've never seen a donkey walking on hot coals. Actually, that would be a terrible thing to behold. My son. Ah, Andrew, you see, even my own mother will join us in the Song of Miriam. They've run out of wine. But it's only the first day? Yes. And it's all gone. Not a drop left. Why are you telling me this? We can't let the celebration end like this. And Etcher's family humiliated. Boys, uh, go join the others. I'll be right there. Mm.
Maybe not now. When? Please. The widow hated you. Fill these jars with water. I'm not sure you heard her clearly, but we've run out of wine, not water. These are similar in size to your own foray. The prudent marks, yes. We could have filled all the way to the brim. You're a very responsible person, aren't you? We are in a crisis, and I was led to understand you have a solution. Do you know why jars for purification rites are made of stone? What? You heard me. Because the stone is pure. Less likely to stain or break, and it can't be made unclean. Yes. Fill these jars with water all the way to the brim. Why? You heard him. Start drawing water, quickly. Tell anyone you find to stop what they're doing and help. From the directions you have provided, I see no logical solution to the problem. It's going to be like that sometimes, Thomas. What did you say? I do not rebuke you. It is good to ask questions, to seek understanding. There's no time for this. I know of a man like you in Capernaum, always counting, always measuring. That's my job. And the people will think I have not done well tonight. Join me, and I will show you a new way to count and measure, a different way of seeing time. Go with you where? I, I don't understand. Keep watching. I do hope you're enjoying yourself. Where are the servers? I don't know, but I'll go find them right away. It is far past time for another round of wine. The last one was nearly an hour ago. Yes, well, you Surely see... Surely there is more common, Dinah. Uh, I'm very sorry. Yeah. Please do not worry. This will be taken care of immediately. Next round of wine right away. Thank you for reminding us it's all in the control. Was your father a son mason as well? Smith. <laughs> I think it broke his heart, but I apprenticed under a stone cutter when I was nine. Every man must leave his father. Mason may seems like harder work. <laughs> it isn't harder, it's just more uh, final. If the smith wants to change the horseshoe or the plowshare or the pot hook, he has only to put the iron back into the fire and reshape it to fit his designs. They're full. Everyone, please step outside. Just for a moment, Thomas.
Once you make that first cut into the stone, it can't be undone. It sets in motion a series of choices. What used to be a shapeless block of limestone or granite begins its long journey of transformation. And it will never be the same. Draw some out and serve it to the master of the banquet. Stop the music! Stop the music! Everyone, listen! I have something I would like to say. I would like to address the bridegroom and the bride families. At every wedding I've ever overseen, they serve the best wine first. And then, when the people have drunk freely, much later in the feast, they serve the poorer wine, the cheap stuff. <laughs> because by then, who is going to notice? <laughs> Am I right? But you, you have chosen now to serve the best wine I have ever tasted. Let us thank them for this unnecessary but honorable gesture. Son of Rafi and Dinah, to Sarah, daughter of Abner and Hila, be as pure and as fruitful as this wine. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. To Asher and Sarah! To Asher and Sarah! Hi, Marcia. She's there, but she agreed. Okay. All right, so on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding 
When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they, were no, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the, to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. 20 to 30 gallons. Think about that. I just <laughs> six jars. And and you know, I didn't put this into this study, but they they would do weddings. The way that a, a, a Galilean wait, wedding was is number 1, you know that um that the the father of the groom was the one that would make them get the wedding kind of prepared, it's like the honeymoon suite. And Jesus gives a parable about that where he talks about that being, you know, with your with your lamps being ready. So they are already like the 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 bridegroom, the groom is excited to go get his bride and the father's like, "Okay, it's time to go get your bride." And they get excited. He's going to go get the bride whenever the father tells him to go get his bride. And then the party lasts as long as the wine lasts. You noticed in, in one of them, he said, but it's only the first day. Like we're almost out. It's only the first day. So they would drink and, and be excited and happy and celebrate until it was gone. And if it was gone too quick, then you're in trouble and they're going to be worried about that. So wine. Wine was a staple at most meals. They drank wine because the water wasn't always good. And I want to make sure I'm clear here. It was fermented as you just as I just read the scripture to you in the in the master of the ceremony. There is very clear to tell you everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. It's just like when we were all younger and dumb, and I know we've done dumb things, that you would drink the best beer first, and then after that was gone, you'd get the Strohs. <laughs> I, 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 we weren't always saved. And that's what he was saying. He's saying, you know, once they've got enough to drink and their senses are dulled, you heard them talk about it. Now they're not going to think too much about what's coming out, but that's not what happened. What happened was is that Jesus turned the water into wine, and it was the best wine they'd ever had. So wine was a state. Now listen, make, make sure I'm clear here, because I will get the book of discipline. I think I had to when I preached on Cheers a few months ago when Jerry was on vacation to read what our stance is as the Free Methodist Church on alcohol. I'm not saying... Go and get a whole, go get 180 gallons of wine and party like there's no tomorrow. I'm giving you the cultural, what they did in that cultural time, and that they drank wine with most every meal. And running out too early was a huge humiliation. They would be, it would be frowned on. It's almost like, well, what did I just allow my daughter to be married into, or vice versa, or what did my son marry into? So it was important for this to, to go down in the way that it was supposed to because culturally speaking, it, it, they would look at it as like, okay, this is going to be a good marriage. And it's interesting that you saw beforehand that Peter and his wife were making wine together. You saw that last week where they were stomping on the wine together just because it was a huge part of their lives. So it might sound strange that Jesus turned water into wine as his first miracle, but it is what happened. 
He turned water into wine. And not only did he turn water into wine, but he used the ceremonial jars that they used to wash and worship to make it. Wrap your mind around that. So the, the marriage or the unity, the two coming together in marriage was important enough that the party needed to continue on. And you think about this, his first miracle is at a wedding. What are we to Jesus? We're his bride. He cares about the union. He cares about the unity. He does his first miracle to, con to have the party continue on where a husband and wife have become man and woman and one, and it signifies the coming, that we are going to be his bride. And I think that is awesome. Because you'd think that you, when we just saw where Nicodemus was telling John, and, and I, don't, I know that's not scriptural, but the, the, he, he embodies the Pharisees in the way that they would have been, is they would have, he, they would have said, how dare you put alcohol into those jars that are made for worship? How dare you do wine into that? Isn't it funny sometimes that we, we think that we know better than God, and when God does things that we think shouldn't be done, we seem to, to try to explain away. And what I mean by that is, is that I don't completely understand the significance behind him saying that. I just know that the wine was not grape juice. But I've heard many pastors preach this and say, and he turned it into Welch's grape juice. So, you, I don't know if that will work or not, Jerry, I have this mic for you. I have this mic for you for that reason. I don't know that there was this deep spiritual significance to this first miracle. Um. I look at it and I think, you know, weddings were important. Um, they didn't, you know, it would have been very humiliating for the bride and groom to have run out of wine. Um, but I look at this and I think there wasn't deep spiritual significance to this. But Jesus did it because it was needed. And. And I think sometimes we think, you know, God's only going to do something because, you know, it, there's this deep spiritual meaning to it. He's only going to bring this healing for a deep spiritual meaning. or He's only going to provide this need because of its deep spiritual meaning or or whatever. And I, obviously God cares about those deep spiritual meanings. <laughs> but do you ever been to the store with one of your grandkids and they ask you to buy them something? What did you do? If you could, you buy it. Right. I mean, you know, often I'll tell them no, but sometimes it'll be like, yeah, I'll buy that for you just because I love you. And I think that's exactly what happened here. Jesus did this because it was needed. So he stepped in. Anybody else have a different idea? I'm not trying to say you should have a different idea than your pastor but you might and this is what bible study should be a little bit especially when it comes into this because again i don't fully understand his first miracle and i agree with pastor jerry that i know that god does things sometimes because he loves us may i say something oh yeah say it marcia sorry Jerry. Uh, i think one of the reasons he did it is because his mother asked him to and he'll do for us if we will just ask him. You know, Kim Gott was just saying that, and now I think she's going to oh. either confirm. No, I'm going to. So, and, and yeah, and that's that's something that we, you know, when you read that in, the, in, in John, we realize that he is honoring his mother. I just know that it's, you know, it, it's not something that we go running around and we just think that we're going to drink 180 gallons of wine. Um and that's something that's, it's hard for people to wrap their mind around because we know that that dr getting drunk is a sin. And I can't, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. If you're an alcoholic, that's a sin. And there's 
multiple things and the, that, that we're doing it, but it's not against God's will to have a glass of wine for your stomach or in this celebration. And nobody, I don't think anyone in that, that is going to be like, okay, Jesus was getting plastered, which I've heard them preach before. And I'm only going on that, that line a little bit is because over the years of hearing pastors try to explain this away as if it wasn't what it was, they're actually making it deeper and more confusing than the reality of what you just said, Marcia, that Jesus, he respected his mother. As Pastor Jerry said, God wants to, to give us good things, and he used it for his glory. What's it say in that last verse that we just pulled up in verse 11? It says, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. So Jesus turning water into wine, though again, we can speculate and talk and everything, but the reality of it was is it revealed his glory, and then it did something more important, or just, as, just like the next important, not more, but following in, is the disciples believed in him. So it helped deepen their faith. So it was for the glory of God, and then it helped deepen the faith of the disciples. That's my next point, is faith. What do you think was going through the minds of the servants when Jesus told them to fill the jars with water? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you want me to do what? We're going to go fetch 180 gallons of water and fill up these jars? And Why? Yeah, I mean, why, why, if you could start, why don't you just cause the water to spark up inside the jar a little bit? But the reality of it is, is that they went and they did get the water, which is another point for me to point out is the way that God works. God, could, God doesn't need me or you for nothing, right? Yet he wants to, to partner with us and use us to the end of his glory. He wants to partner with us and use us to deepen our faith so that we believe in him all the more because he loves us. You understand? So they're, they're like, go get the water. They had to do that. They had to take the first step in believing what he said and then doing what he asked them to do in the instructions to the T. You know, Mary turned and looked at him and said, do whatever he tells you to do. Why should I do whatever he tells me to do? Isn't he just a guest like nobody is like anybody else? What's he going to do? We can't just go make wine out of nothing. It'd be like, you know, today we run out of wine. I'm going to go to the liquor store. If the liquor store doesn't have it, I'm going to go to the grocery store. If the grocery store doesn't have it, I can go to CVS and I can just find whatever I'm looking for. Back then, it's like we're out of wine. You're going to have to go back to the press. You better take your shoes off. We're going to jump around on some grapes. You got six to eight weeks for it to ferment. Or as you heard her talk about, it was like 30-year-old wine was the start. So it wasn't, it was, it was a start. And I gotta tell you this, what would you been think what would have you been thinking? What was your what would be your thoughts, Peggy? Somebody's like, okay. What would be your thoughts? So one of the things that I love about The Chosen is that The Chosen puts a human aspect into the scriptures. And what I mean by that is, is that when I read this in John 2, I've read this multiple times throughout my life, had multiple different opinions and theories and crazy thoughts on this miracle. But you always read it as if Jesus spoke and they said, yes, Lord, how high? But as I've grown to realize there's a human aspect to this, they're like, could you imagine they're mumbling? Like, oh, this is the stupidest wedding I've ever been paid to go to. 
Man, I can't believe I got hired in this. Now this guy's got me wasted time. 180 gallons of wine or 180 gallons of water that somehow is going to turn into wine at 8 pounds a gallon and I got to carry it all. 8,000 pounds of water. Why am I doing this, Dave? No, I think... So, so then the other, other part of me, when I think of who Jesus is, could you imagine, though, his steadfastness? You understand what I'm saying? He's there in the presence. And even though they might be mumbling and grumbling, they're looking on him and there's like something that's there. And they do it anyway. So it... it humbles me in this story to think about the servants because even though Jesus asked them to do something that was impossible they end up doing it because of who he is and I know they were grumbling you know they were you know they were you know it reminds me of a time when I was was really broke I was a real poor preacher like made four thousand dollars I was just telling Miss the other day when I was looking at my social security Thing for because I had to find a, get a new card and in 2008 I made four thousand four hundred and one dollars and that was because I was full time at the church and that's what they paid me and I had five dollars to my name on a Sunday morning and this lady came up to me and she asked me if I had five dollars and I was like fighting inter- internally I don't I, I do but I know how to give it to you I only have five dollars left. And I just could feel like the Holy Spirit's like, I'm fighting, I'm grumbling. No, 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 give her my five dollars. What am I gonna do? I can't even put a gallon of gas in my car back then. It was a gallon for five bucks. And I'm thinking, well, no, 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 you know, and finally I just grateful, here you go. I'm so glad I can help you. Like Jerry's like, ah. Oh. She took the five dollar bill out of my hand and she put a hundred dollar bill in its stead. And she said, this is for you. You get my point? Sometimes, you know, God will work with us in spite of us. Think about the trust it would have taken to serve the master of the banquet water in place of wine. One of the things that that they changed for, for, you know, cinema, like the visual of it, is that Jesus puts his hand in there, he sees the wine, they come in, they're like, oh, it's wine! If you read in John, they drew out water at first. And by the time that he took the cup from there where it was water to the master of the banquet, it had somehow in between that journey turned into to wine. Think about the amount of trust. So now you've had me fill up all of these jars with water for what reason? And then you want me to draw a cup of water out and take it to the master of the banquet? What am I trying to do? Am I trying never to work in this town again? Am I trying to humiliate our hosts? Think about that. Could you trust Jesus that much? In the face of humiliation, in the face of I'm never going to work again, trust Jesus that much. And you all have been in that situation, and that's where it comes back to what I mentioned at the beginning. The type of witness that God is calling us to be is not a, well, I've witnessed this, but no, I've experienced the goodness of God. And I can witness about his goodness, his love, his long-suffering, his ability to to meet me where I'm at, love people where they are, because he loves me where I'm at, and he's sovereign over everything. He's calmed the storms in my life more than I can count. He's given me peace that surpasses my own understanding. And I have to wonder, can I trust Jesus that much to do the impossible? That's a hard question. I have, but will I continue? You know what I'm saying? Isaiah 43 10 says you are my witnesses declares the Lord and my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me 
and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. To be a witness to, be a witness is to see, sorry, that's my dyslexia when I typed it, hear or know through personal experience. Describe your personal experience with Jesus and use this moment to testify to your own heart about what he's done for you. That's a your turn, by the way. Does anybody want to testify? Marcia, do you have a testimony? Um, not that I can think of right now. It's all right. One more, your turn. Proverbs 34 says, Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Whose hands have gathered up the wind? Who is wrapped up in the waters of a cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is the name of his son? Surely you know. Can anyone answer this before we end? It's Jesus. <laughs> it's definitely Jesus. Yes, that was the question that, that John the Baptist asked Nicodemus. And Nicodemus said, you are blaspheming. I'm really looking forward. We have two, we have next week and then the week after we're going into John 3. So and it's going to be all, the whole thing is just John 3, chapter 3 broke down. So for four weeks, we're going to break John chapter 3 down. That excites me. So anybody have anything else to add to this? Yeah, I'm, we're pushing right on the wire. I see your, Jerry's showing me the land of the plane. So next week, Jesus is the one true king. Marcia, do you want to end us in prayer? Yes, thank you. Heavenly Father, as we conclude our Bible study tonight, I just ask a blessing upon Pastor Josh, Pastor Jerry, and everyone who has taken part in this study. Help us to be obedient like the servants. Help us to trust you like the servants. Help us to be bold like Jesus' mother and ask you when we need your help. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would lead us through this holy week help us to understand just exactly what you have done for us the miracles just keep coming and we thank you and praise you in jesus name amen amen so um just to let you all know um if anyone's looking for a foot washing ceremony for tomorrow night if you want to relive that um don't come to talking to me Love you guys. I'll, I'll, I'll see you. See you on Friday. Good Friday service at noon and at seven. That just got brought up because somebody told me today they were doing a foot wash, washing service, and I said, "Bless you, brother. Bless you." <laughs> good, good night. Good night. <laughs>